All right. So as I told you, as I already told you in the group, I invited Mr. Matthew Clausen uh, for our English Conversational Club. And well, I was surprised because I had a long time without talking to him. I think the last time we talked was in 2008 when I traveled to Washington, D.C. Um, as a youth ambassador. And I was like, well, why don't I text him and see what happens? So he's, he's very kind and he accepted his, uh, our invitation to, to join. And to, due to the topic that we're talking, you know that it is not easy for us to digest to the differences we have, the differences in the Venezuelan elections and American elections are really, really broad. <laughs> so um, I have tried to explain um, the best as I can, <laughs> but I know that there might be some things that I couldn't cover. So is that we take advantage of Mr. Matthew here um, in our conversational club and ask him many questions and, you know, try to practice. Uh, don't be nervous. This is not the time to be nervous. I know Mr. Matthew is very, um, very kind and will understand everything you say. Okay. And in case we have problems, um, we, we're here to, uh, to have your backs. Okay. So, um, uh, Mr. Clausen, are, are you there? Can you I listen have, to me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. So, um, I have read that in order to choose the president of the United States, um, Americans do not vote directly for their president. They choose electors in the electoral college. So, my question is, who are these electors? How, how I mean, um, how do they get there? to be considered an elector. Great. Um, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to speak with you. Um, all, everybody, nice to meet you virtually. Um, even if you're a little, a little icon on the stream, uh, it's nice to meet you. I, um, you can call me Matt or Matthew. Um, we can keep this informal. Um, I um, have had the pleasure and honor to visit Venezuela on, sev on several occasions and you have a great country and I know it's a challenging time. Um, and if you understand everything that's in this PowerPoint um, from the time you reviewed it, you probably know more about US elections uh, than many Americans do, unfortunately. So um, a conversation about the Electoral College is um, very important and it's very relevant and it's something that I talk about with my friends and a lot of people talk about here because it is a unique um, and by unique I don't necessarily mean good um, element of our electoral system. Um, if anything say um, is confusing or you can't hear me, please ask me to repeat. Um, many years ago, I was an English teacher for one year. I understand. Be courageous. We'll get, we'll get the message through. So don't, uh, don't, don't, don't hold back from speaking just because you don't, you're nervous or something. Um, so your question, um, typically the electors, um, in the United States, we have basically two major parties, Democrats and Republicans. Typically, the electors are party loyalists. They're people who have, in different states in the United States, have demonstrated their allegiance by campaigning, by representing one party or another, and they're viewed as incredibly faithful to that particular uh, party. Um, and so I, I believe that, you know, it's, it's a process where each of the major parties can, can nominate electors 
and then they take uh, different types of, of pledges, promises, that they will vote in, in accordance with the rules established by their state. Um, and so those rules are generally um, that they will vote for whoever wins the popular vote in their state. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute. That's, it's um, a way, it's the so-called all or none rule. So if in the state of California, um, the majority of people vote for candidate A, then all of the electors in California will vote for candidate A. Even if only candidate A won 51% of the California popular vote, all of California's electors would vote for that candidate. So on the, yes, so California is the most populous state. So the, it's the state with the most electors because it's the state with the most people. Um, okay. So if you win California popular vote, you get 55 electoral votes toward uh, of the 538 available. And you have to get uh, more than half of the 538 to be the president, and that's 270. So 270, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. All right, okay. Um, so what, what I understand is that the same parties nominate their electors. Yes? Yeah, I don't know a lot about the the formal process of nominating the electors, but generally it's a ceremonial, um, it's a ceremonial position. You, if you're nominated as an elector, you don't have much of a choice in what you do. You follow the rules, but it's an honor to, to, to be part of that process. Um, and so, it's uh, but it's but it's not um, the state laws don't allow the electors generally don't allow the le the electors to do what they want they have to follow the rules which is typically you have to vote for whoever won in your state and it doesn't matter what party you're from as an elector you have to cast your electoral electoral college vote for whoever won the popular vote in your state. The only two states that that is different are the two states of, of, of um, I believe it's um, Maine, and I'm gonna mess this up, Maine and Colorado, I believe. There's two states. Yeah, uh, uh, that, no, it, um, it's Maine and Nebraska. Nebraska, thank you. See, you know more than I yes. do. Um, it's, <laughs> it's just that I read it. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's important. Um, so, um, well, let me stop there if, and see if there's another question, and and I, we can answer that. But I'll, I'll I'll then I can share some thoughts about um, what are the challenges of this system, and how it how it was created, and and maybe where what happens in the future. Okay, all right. Hi, hello, good afternoon. Hi, Junior. Hi, I was asking if what happened if any of the candidates uh, don't get at least 217 votes? What happened in that case? Uh, so, yes. What happens if none of the candidates get to 270? Um, that's, yes. That is possible, and it's possible um, if there are, if there is a third candidate from a third party, or it's possible if you have 269 to 269. And what happens by the Constitution then 
passes the responsibility to the United States Congress, to the lower house of representatives to break the tie um, and to, or not, to break the tie or to vote who will be president. So if it's a tie, then, then whoever's party is in control with the majority in the House of Representatives would pick their candidate, presumably. In, in the current environment, um, that would favor the Democrats because the Democrats have the majority in the House of Representatives and the Republicans have the majority in the Senate but the Senate does not have a role in, in this tie break. Okay, I get it. It's a good question. In, in, um, in 2016, when it was Trump versus Clinton and Trump unexpectedly won, there was, there's a period of time between the first Tuesday in November, which is the election, and when the actual electors vote in the electoral college. That happens, I think, in early January. So there's a period of time where it's not official, but everybody knows who is going to be president. Um, but because Trump's election day victory was so surprising and so alarming, to many, there was a conversation as to whether if there were enough electors who didn't do what they were expected to do, if they could vote instead for Hillary Clinton um, and change the result, essentially. And they, um, uh, several electors did that. And uh, they're called unfaithful electors. And they, um, depending on what state they're in, there were legal challenges. Um, and they, um, in many states, if you say, I will not follow my pledge and I will not vote for the winner of the popular vote in my state, then they, they remove you from being an elector that day and they put a new person there. So, there was a there was an idea that maybe there would be a protest, but the rules don't they don't really allow for it. Okay, um, it's difficult um, to to go for that decision, not abiding to the to the. I mean to to the majority's vote. I mean, if being an elector. I mean, if you're considered uh, for that for that place, right? Um, it would be a hard decision to make. I mean, to go opposite <laughs> to what the people want. Well, or to go opposite of what the law says you have to do. Um, well, you know, it, yes, it's true in your state to go opposite what the people want would be hard. But in the case of 2016. Um, over the the whole country voted for Hillary Clinton in a majority by uh, three million votes in a country of um, I forget how many total people voted, but you know it was um, several percent more in in popular vote. Um, but because they don't calculate that way. Um, and you see the map on the screen that shows, you know, how many points you get if you win the popular vote in each of these states. And so when I was a kid and in a lot of history classes or civics classes, I remember learning, you know, the founding fathers of our country created this system because it was unique and it was the best for this particular country when it was founded in the late 1700s. Um, and you often are taught that the electoral college is a way to favor some small states 
because they get more representation than they otherwise would because the number of electors is calculated by how many representatives you have in Congress that are proportional to your population plus two, two senators. Yeah. So if you're a tiny state with no very few people like North Dakota on the top of the map, you have one representative in, in the House of Representatives and you have two senators. One plus two is three elector electoral college votes. Each person in North Dakota has a, each voter in North Dakota has a greater influence on the presidential election than each voter in New York or California. Because New York, New North Dakota is overrepresented for its population in the Electoral oh, okay. College. So, but that's, um, that's not why we have the Electoral College. The, the real reason that we have the Electoral College is slavery. And in the, the, when the first colonies in the Northeast were um, newly independent and they were having their first constitutional congresses to determine what the constitution, what the rules would look like, the Southern states had a large population. So if the popular vote, if it was a direct vote, direct popular national vote, like it is in most countries, you would think the Southern votes, the Southern states would get, would be happy because they'd have a lot of influence, but a very large proportion of the Southern states people were slaves who didn't have the right to vote. So the Southern yeah. states, particularly Virginia, negotiated to be able to have automatically um, two senators, two, the so plus two, and then they were allowed themselves to, to estimate their population in order to determine their, representat their representations in Congress. So the, it was a way, it was a negotiation, a sad negotiation, but it was a negotiation that was very political and based on how they could bring the union together while maintaining slavery. So um, that's one of the big reasons we have the system. Um, and, you know, even with, I mean, it has a dark history, we can still analyze its merits today based on whether it serves democratic purposes or not. And I can um, comment on that too, but I see there's a question from Char. Open your microphone, please. Uh, okay. Uh, my question, Mr. Martin, my question is, um, it's about, you know, uh, all the worries living this situation with, uh, with the COVID. And I would like to know if the process in United States, the election process, how will be the election pro process? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, so we have, as, as a federal system, um, the, the elections process is um, implemented at the state level. So even though it sounds strange, the exact rules of how you can vote in a presidential election are determined at the individual state level. So um, every state decides if they are going to have increased flexibility in voting because of COVID, or if you have to go to the polls on election day and vote in person. Some states have already, um, many states have already uh, moved to a mail-in voting system way, many years ago. Um, some states, a few states, maybe one or two or three, 
have only mail vote. So there's no in-person voting anymore. Um, many states allow you to vote by mail if you have an excuse, like you're sick or you're, you're going to be traveling. Um, other states allow you to vote by mail no matter what, but you have to ask for it. They won't ask you why, but you have to ask and say, I want to vote by mail. Um, in COVID times, there are some states and here, I live in Washington. It's not a state, but it's a territory. It's a federal district and um, we get three electoral votes. Um, uh, Washington DC has, um, like a lot of states, decided that they will mail ballots to everybody who's registered, whether or not they ask. And you have an option to vote by mail this election. Um, even if you don't ask, you can. You can also vote on election day in person and um, they are opening up basketball stadiums and other places with more distance, more space to allow safe voting. Um, however, the president um, opposes those states who have automatic mail-in votes and um, is, has been accused of manipulating the leadership of the United States Postal Service, the mail, um, and has, has been accused of trying to slow down the mail. Um, there's an investigation. And it, what, he, what the president has done is speak publicly to say that he doesn't believe that the mail is, um, is a safe way to vote in some states, even though he himself is voting by mail in Florida. Um, it's, um, there, is, there is very little evidence, very little evidence that, that there is fraud in mailing voting. So um, that's a long answer to your question, Char, that I think um, people have more options in how they vote here this year, but still not as many as they should have. I think I think it's very. Thank you, sir. I mean, when I hear about mailing and voting, I mean, imagine that in Venezuela. That's unthinkable. <laughs> because I mean, here in Venezuela, um, the system is arguable. I mean, if it is corruptible or not. So imagine if that were as mailing. <laughs> That can be even worse, I guess. I don't know. Um, you have another question, Matthew. Um, uh, well, next in order is Junior. Junior, are you there? Yes, uh, I'm here. I, I have a question. Is any requirement to be an elector? For example, if, I'm, if I am a senator, can, I can be an elector. Uh, okay. Um, I don't, I mean, I believe you have to be a citizen. Um, I don't know. Um, I believe you do have to be a citizen. I don't know if there are any other requirements other than that you were nominated to be an elector by your state party. Um, uh, I don't know if there are any other requirements, but um, that's a good question. Okay, at least you have to be a citizen. At least, I believe so. Um, I, I, I that would that would be my assumption, but I don't I don't know for sure. Okay. okay. But I think that he's right, uh, Junior. When you say that, I mean, if you are a senator or if you are a representative in the House of Representatives, you are not allowed to be a, an elector, right? Yes, I think so. But I I I thought about that, and I have that question. But I think like like you. 
What, what do you say, Matthew? I mean, being a senator or a representative in the House of Representatives prevents you to be an elector, right? These are, uh, that's a good question. Uh, also a very good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you make me curious. I want to go look it up. I don't know. I, I, I've never, I have never, I have never heard of that happening. But because again, these 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 um, member these electoral college positions are kind of saved as honorary gifts for politically active people, and a senator or a representative already has plenty of visibility and they don't need that but the electoral college is a chance for a party to say uh thank you um uh you, you know thank you for your your dedication to our cause um would you like to be an elector in this next election perfect perfect um well there is uh taristan next taristan uh, me again, uh, uh, Mr. Matthew, you were talking about that some states can participate in this process by mailing voting, but I would, like to, I would like to know if this process can, would delay the election. Would, would be the same like before or, or delay many uh, Another days to to have the the results. Yeah, um, that's another great question. Um, so again, because we are a country made up of fifty states, and there's different rules in each each state. Um, there's different rules about um, when mail-in ballots have to be received. Some states require that the mail-in ballot be, um, be, be, be stamped by the Postal Service um, on the election day or before. Other states talk of not about when it was stamped, but by when it, when it was received. And some states allow, you could mail something today and it won't arrive for five more days. Some states allow any any um, any ballot that was stamped by election day and received by five days after election day will count. So yes, especially during COVID times, more people will vote by mail, and the vote counting will be more difficult. And because the vote could be could be close, we don't know. On election day, the media loves to use exit polling where they ask people who come out of the polls if they're willing to say who they voted for. And then they use statistical analysis to determine, because no one can see the ballots, but they use the statistical analysis to determine who they believe win, won the majority in each state. And when that majority is very clear, then the Associated Press and other major media organizations will say, you know, we now determine that Oklahoma has voted for Trump. And then they'll move the seven votes into his basket. Um, with mail-in voting, it's very possible that on election night, we will not have uh, enough information to be able to predict who won the election. And, and it's somewhat dangerous that it's very possible that, um, that re Republican leaning states, in other words, states that are more conservative, that are red on this map, um, that typically vote more Republican, also tend to have less flexibility in voting. So they don't allow as much mail-in voting in general. So it's very possible that on election night, we'll get a lot of results 
from Republicans voting in person and not yet a lot of results from Democrats mailing their votes. So if somebody wanted to say, if the president wanted to say, based on all the votes we have now, it looks like I'm winning or I won. <laughs> but then tomorrow or five days from now, all of a sudden you start counting all the other things and states start flipping and he could lose. Now the system will count the votes and that's what will happen. But what happens when there's one or two or five days of public campaigning and uh, pronouncements of electoral fraud when there hasn't been fraud, it's just been a delay. It's, a, it's something that is being talked about among the media to be very careful um, not to be not to start predicting states too soon. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Sure. Um, we have another question from Armando. Are you there? Can you speak? Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Well, uh, initially my question was that if the people from uh, Puerto Rico and Hawaii can vote also, but watching the screen you shared, I, I can see Alaska and Hawaii are considered states also. So so I'm asking now, what about another, like like for example, the people from Puerto Rico, can they vote or, or not? Um, correct. So yes, Alaska and Hawaii are, are 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 two of the 50 states so they uh they have votes in the electoral college um as does the district of columbia so the 50 states plus the district of columbia have votes in the electoral college u.s territories that include places like the marshall islands puerto rico um, guam um, do not they are not states and they do not have votes in the electoral college the individual parties the democratic party for example and the republican party i believe both um, allow those territories the people in those territories to vote in the primary election um, as they choose their candidates but in the general election um, the anybody who lives anywhere except a state or the District of Columbia does not have electoral college votes. Okay, thank you. Okay, up, up next, um, Oriana? You there? Sir? Hello. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, how long does the election process take? Good question. So the, um, you know, in, in, in the Constitution, the election day is established as the second Tuesday in November. Um, there are many people who have um, advocated for there not to be a single election day, but many days. Um, that's never been changed. It's never uh, there's never been a constitutional amendment to make that change. However, the increase in mail-in voting, early voting, has made the actual votes on election day be a uh, smaller and smaller percentage of the overall number of votes cast. Now, after election day, so this, day, this year election day is November 3rd, um, by... Um, the there's there's a date i believe the date is in in early january by which the it's re, uh, constitutionally required that there be a decision by the electoral college or if there's a tie or or not a not a um not a majority uh then uh there and it goes to the house of representatives they have to make the decision by this date i think it's in early january and the change of president the inauguration of the next president or the next term has to happen on january 20th so november 3rd to january 20th is the time between the election and the change in leadership okay thank you sure um, 
There is another question from Marianne Lee. Yeah, um, I, I just want to know if Americans that are abroad uh, can vote on election day. Yes, they can. They need to be registered. They have to register to vote and they can vote abroad. They usually vote in the, via either the mail or via the embassies and consulates. Um, but they, um, they also can cast votes and it also can take more time to count them. All right, uh, we have Suali. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to know if, do you think any of candidates has any socialist political tendencies? Uh, I, of the two major candidates, uh, Trump and Biden, uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that um, uh, it's a common political strategy from the Republicans to accuse anybody on the Democrat side of being a socialist. Um, I don't think there's a lot of evidence to support um, that, that either candidate has um, you know, some Marxist or socialist uh, platform. However, um, there's very clear differences on things like healthcare. The U.S. healthcare system um, is a was a private healthcare system basically, and under Barack Obama, there was a, an act, the Affordable Care Act, that was passed. That, that provides for um, a public insurance option. And the, generally the Republicans um, want to eliminate that again, and the Democrats want to strengthen it. The Republicans like to call it socialized medicine. The Democrats say it's a fair and just health system. So, so the word socialism is being used as, as a political football. And I think you really have to look at what is the policies that each of them are advocating. That's a, that's a thing. <laughs> um, can you please give us a little insight about the healthcare system? I mean, has it worked or, or what? I mean, I, I believe, and this is my personal opinion that, um, yeah. you know, that our healthcare system was broken it still, it still has many, many, many problems. It's too expensive. It, it still does not serve many, many people. Um, but with the adoption of the Affordable Care Act, um, which many people call Obamacare, um, it, it was much better. And it, 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 it unfortunately, um was weakened by some supreme court decisions but i do believe we're in a better place than we were before we had that health care system but basically um many people get their health care if they're employed full-time they get their health care through their employer um, and if you were not employed health care was too expensive um, or if your employer didn't offer a good plan, you, you oftentimes were left without insurance. What the Affordable Care Act allowed people to do was to buy insurance as an individual out of an insurance marketplace, which was private plans, but in a, in a, in a government regulated marketplace so that you could have more and more people insured than were insured before. But if anybody knows, you know, the theory behind insurance is that you have to have a pool big enough that you can distribute the risk. And one of the ways to make that pool of people big enough is to make a requirement that you have insurance. Otherwise, only the sick people will buy insurance and the healthy people won't and you won't have enough money 
in the pool. So the Affordable Care Act required people to have health insurance. And yeah. the Supreme Court essentially, in, in the Affordable Care Act said, if you don't have health insurance, then you have to pay a penalty. And the Supreme Court ruled that that penalty was unconstitutional. And so they eliminated the penalty. So the system is not as strong as it was five or six years ago. So anyway, it's a complex system. It's, it's, it's much more expensive than most developed countries and it needs a lot of improvement. So the same day when you're going to, to elect the president of the United States, on that same day, you choose the members of the House of Representatives and the senators on that same ballot? Um, yes and no. Yes, in um, every, so presidential elections are every four years. Uh, for the, the Congress has two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So the House of Representatives serve two year terms so every presidential election, all members of the House of Representatives, there's 430, uh, 438 members of the House of Representatives um, ha are up for election. So this November 3rd, all members of the House of Representatives will be up for election. And they're also up for election in the midterm election. So halfway through every presidential term, they have another election. So, uh, yes, all members of the House of Representatives, the Senate has 100, the Senate has 100 senators. Um, approximately one third of the senators are up for election uh, this year. And any, every two years, the Senate is designed to be, to be staggered so that you have about one third of senators to be elected every two years. Senators serve six year terms. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. There may also be uh, local elections. There may be state and local elections that people are voting uh, also on election day. They may have local decisions to make. So if you live in Washington, DC, or you live in Nebraska, the presidential part of your ballot is going to be the, the same or very similar, but then there may be other parts of your ballot that you're voting for local issues. Okay, okay. All right. Um, okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, we have Hernan. You want to talk, Hernan? Yes, thank you, teacher. Hello, Matthew. Um, I want to ask, uh, there are countries where different, where there are different ways to vote. For example, in Australia, you can vote early before the day of the process. There is another way that is online voting. Uh, you can vote by post, you can vote by phone, and you can vote in person. What are the, the types of, of votes in the United States? Sure. Thanks, Hernan. Um, so depending on where you live, the early voting option it may be possible. Uh, and in some places, it may be all by mail. Um, so you can vote by mail um, or you can vote in person. And those are basically the two ways you can vote. But how you vote in person can make can vary a lot. There are states that have um, paper ballots. There are states that have electronic voting machines inside of the voting place in the, in the, in, in the precinct. Um, there has been a tendency, there was a while where after the 2000 presidential election in the United States, which was basically a tie between Al Gore and George W. Bush, um, and it came down to a recount in the state of Florida. And in the state of Florida, as they were recounting the ballots, they were 
famous pictures of people holding you know the paper up and trying to determine was the hole here or was the hole here and they were did the paper fall out what was what was the person trying to vote for um and so that led to a lot of scrutiny a lot of analysis about should these machines be electronic um but then at the same time you had concerns about hacking and electronic interference. And so you, it's a back and forth. Now, the advantage of having the system of voting the United States has where it's so local is that it's difficult for a hacker or a foreign government to interfere with the presidential election. It's difficult with the actual voting because the voting is happening in so many different places in so many different ways. Um, so there, there's, why, there's solid evidence, for example, that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 election, but not, they did not interfere with the actual voting. They interfered with, with misinformation and um, fake news and social media. They didn't, in, they didn't change votes in a machine. But right now you have, in my local voting precinct where I go to vote in a normal year, when I, pick, when I go and I, and I tell them who I am, they give me the ballot, they ask me, paper or electronic? And most people vote paper, but they have two types of machines. And you can either push buttons on a screen or you can punch or you can connect lines on a paper. And then you bring your paper ballot to a machine that, that then counts it. So there's a lot of different um, ways, but there's no phone voting. There's no internet voting um, uh, at the federal, in, in the presidential election. No, oh, it's, it's amazing. Thank you very much. Sure. Up next, we have Alvaro. Let me th I think I understand what you're asking. So um, the there's many more there's many more representatives in the House. They are constantly changing because they're all elected or re-elected every two years. They are they are representing a specific district, a specific small part of one state are their constituents that are voting for them. So they are much more concerned with local issues related to their district. And um, in the Senate, each state has two senators and they are responsible for their entire state. Um, so it's, it's more state level than local district level. Um, there are fewer senators. There are a hundred, hundred senators. There's, there's 435 in the house. Um, so each Senator has a, a little more visibility, um, um, and tends to, and they're also elected for six years, six year terms. So many people say the Senate provides uh, more long view, more analysis of laws that they're more calm because they don't have to be elected every two years um, and that the house is more on fire and responsive and more vocal and more controversial but those are stereotypes um, in the end for a, a bill to become a law it has to go through both the house and the senate so as as bodies they they're both equally important in passing a law. Uh, so uh, there, there's some equivalency to that. And like I said before, right now, the House is, the Democrats have a significant majority in the House and the Republicans have a small majority in the Senate. Okay, okay. Um, 
I'm thinking about other questions to ask, but there are other questions in the chat, so let's address them. Um, Junior? Yes, hi. Uh, I was thinking, here in Venezuela, the figure of the vice president is not important. The president of Venezuela can change the person who is working by vice president if they consider the president is not doing well. I think for the citizen of the United States, it's important the figure of the vice president. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, the, I think the answer is it, it depends. Um, in in the United States, the Constitution dictates that they are elected together on the same ticket. So, the the president, the candidates pick their vice presidential running mate um, before the election and the voters are voting for them together. So you always have the vice president of the same party as the president from the election. Um, many, for many presidents in the past, the vice president has a, 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 a more private role and, and is not very visible and is, um, is not somebody that the citizens think too much about. But there have been other times when the vice president has has been asked by the president to lead something very important um, and becomes a really important partner to the president in how they govern and lead. And that depends on the vice president. It depends on the president. Right now, um, well, Trump is the incumbent, so he, Trump already has his vice president. He could, uh, he, he can't just remove his vice president now and put someone else in. I mean, the vice president could resign, but there's succession rules. But Trump does not have to pick his current vice president as his running mate. Um, he could change, he could bring another, vi another possible vice president with him on the ballot, but he hasn't, he didn't do that. He's still running with his vice president, um, which is what is typical. Um, because Biden, Joe Biden is quite, both of them are old, uh, older than Joe Biden if he's elected, will be the oldest president on the first day of his term. Um, because of that, uh, I think that his selection of a vice presidential running mate is something that, um, that citizens are looking at quite closely because um, if something happens, it's very likely um, it's more likely uh, than in some other circumstances that the vice president might have to assume the presidency or that if Joe Biden were to win, that he would decide not to run for his second term. And if he was popular and he decided not to run for his second term, his vice president would likely be the top candidate if in his case, if she decided to run for president. So he has selected um, Kamala Harris, and uh, she is considerably younger than he is. And I'd say a lot of people are paying attention to her selection, and they view her through the lens of, would she be a good future president? OK, perfect. Thank you. Olivia. OK. Yeah. The question is, where is chosen the Senate? And House Representatives, the result, the results are the same day. Um, I know that each of them is uh, is uh, in different periods. But you say the House Representative is every every two years, and the Senate every six years, no? That's 
That's it. Okay, but the results are the same day, in the same day. Um, so the results are, you know, the election day this year is November 3rd. Um, as soon as it's clear who has the most votes in a, in a, in a house race or in a Senate race, then that, that will be the, the prediction that they are going to be the next representative or the next Senator. The, the, the election results are, are then certified by each state that takes a little bit more time. But if, if somebody is winning 70% to 30% on election night and most votes have been counted, then probably the winning, the leading candidate, um, the losing candidate will often make a phone call to the leading candidate and say, congratulations, I concede to you, you won. Now, again, things may be different this year with the number of mail-in votes, but usually we know the same night or within several days who has won in each of those races. They don't start their jobs um, until the new year um, when the Congress, the next group convenes. They start in January, but the election results are known in November. Thank you. Okay, um, we have another question from Soli. Yes. Uh, Mr. Matthew, what do you think is the strain of United States government system that uh, has made this country more su successful than the rest uh, of an other countries. I know mm, the citizens, uh, I, I know you. the country has problems, but um, is, uh, you know, um, is a power country. And uh, I think it must uh, have a, a good government system because the, the success of any country not depend uh, of their their either resource, you know, because Venezuela has a lot of resource, but you know all the problem here, and I think he is the the so I think we have weaknesses in our system. And uh, what is the strength of the United States government? Thank you uh, for the question. That's a big question. Um, you know, I think there have been, there, there are, you know, in terms of being a global economic um, and military power as a country, for example, there may be legitimate strengths that contributed to that. And there may be um, things that are not just that have enabled that also. And um, so the current standing of the United States is not only the result of the good things that it did, it may also be the result of some of the bad things. So I wanna be careful not to assume the current standing of the country is uniquely a result of all the, all the good things that its government has done. So, um, but let me highlight maybe a couple of things that I think if they are preserved are particularly good, which is, I mean, clearly um, a, a clear separation of powers between the branches, if it is maintained, is a, is a helpful counterbalance. Um, institutional strength, um, there's um, the current environment in the last several years in this country has been one in which many institutions have been attacked um, you know, from the executive and uh, it has been uh, a challenge. But I think that in a lot of cases, it was those very institutions, even though they were weakened during this period, they still many times carried out their 
their function um, in an appropriate way and resisted being, um, uh, you know, coerced and forced to do something that is not against their own mandate. Um, I could give examples, you know, you know, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, you know, reports under an attorney general. The attorney general is supposed to be independent because they're upholding the law. Um, the current president tried to manipulate the attorney general um, and there was the institution pushed back. Damage was done, but the institution and the roles were, were, were fairly strong before. And that's helped, I think, maintain some level of, um, uh, of, of sort of division of labor and responsibility among institutions. So I think uh, that's one thing. I think another thing is, is the, the states, um, the balance between federalism, the federal responsibilities at the national level and individual states it can be very confusing from the outside to understand why are things different in this state than that state? How do I know which law to follow? Why are the rules different here or there? But having a lot of different states allows for a lot of um, experimenting and a lot of different uh, to test out what works, what doesn't work. And if uh, if, if a society is legitimately evaluating those experiments and learning from them, I think that's a good thing. Um, if they're not, and in often cases they're not, it's not a good thing. And if every state is doing their own thing when it's clear that there's a better way, then it's not a strength. Um, so, you know, but I, I think to your question again, the country here, since it since its independence uh, from uh, England is still only about um, 250 years old. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of that time still had legalized slavery. Uh, a lot of that time it had um, and still has at some level colonial conquests and um, you know, manipulation uh, through foreign interference or war in other countries around the world that are of potentially national importance to the United States and maintaining a certain order that favors um, the world order in a way that benefits the country. So I think you need to look carefully at what are the reasons behind these certain policies? Is this um, the result of a functioning government or is it the result of people getting away with things uh, in order at the expense of others? So I, I don't, I, 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 I'm, I'm very happy to live in this country. I'm very grateful for the positive things. And I think part of being a good citizen is trying to recognize and, um, and say very loudly the things that aren't right. And, um, and there's plenty of things that aren't right too, especially in a time like these. And that would be the story for another conversation, I think, but. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're getting closer to, to the end, but now that you are addressing the fact that every state um, has the opportunity to set their own rules, um, that reminds me that we read about 48 of the states uh, follow the method of first past the post, um, while two of the states, Maine and Nebraska, follow the proportional representation. Yes? Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, do you think that other states would add to that same method in the future? Is there a possibility yeah. that this can happen? Yeah, that's, I'm glad you asked that because um, if you, there, there's a, um, actually there's an opinion article in uh, yesterday's New York Times 
um, that's the title of it is the electoral college will destroy America. <laughs> um, that that's a bit of hyperbole, um, but it has a good summary if anyone wants to read it um, as to how can we improve this situation. Um, and I'll say, I, I think the electoral college is a bad system. Um, I think it is. It's, it, it deals with a federal office of president, a vote, vote for president, and it's a system in, in which one person, one vote is not true because there are, there are not, it's not because the small states have more members in the electoral college per person. That's not why it's really bad. It's, I, I think that's not good, but it's bad because in a state that votes for candidate A in a majority, everyone who voted for candidate B is not counted. Their votes disappear, except in those two states. And that's, that's, not, a good, uh, that's not a good method to uh, make sure that a, a president is, is electing and campaigning for all of the country. Now, when you add to that the influence of money in politics, which is a big problem, and you, you look at campaign strategy, um, most of the time, if you watch the headlines in the news in the next six weeks and you see Trump or Biden traveling, they will be traveling to Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, Wisconsin, Arizona, or Michigan, and maybe I forgot one. Those are the six or seven states that are close enough to the split that they have a chance to get the majority. Those are the, they call them the swing states. And those are the ones that are, that are not deep red and they're not deep blue. They may be purple, they may be pink uh, or white. Um, so, those are, um, why is it that a citizen in one of those states should get more attention from candidates than citizens somewhere else? There's, there's no reason. Um, and the reason is tactical by the presidents because they can potentially get those electoral colleges. So um, what's the solution? There's two solutions. One is a, a constitutional amendment to eliminate the electoral college. That is very unlikely to happen because it requires that each, that, that three quarters of, each, of all states, 75% of all states have to ratify that amendment in their state governments. And with this political division, it's just not gonna happen. The second way to fix the problem is for all of the states or more of the states to do what Nebraska and Maine are doing and agree uh, to have the, uh, the, the, electoral, um, the, the electoral college be, be awarded. Um, in some cases, it's proportionally, but what the rules, there's a, something called the national popular vote interstate compact and states are, are signing the compact and what it says is if enough states sign this compact we those states will change our electoral college rules and our electoral college electors will be required to vote for the candidate who wins the national popular vote instead of my state's popular vote they will be required to vote for the candidate who wins the national popular vote. And this compact says that as soon as we have enough states that sign up for this, that promise to do this, and by enough, as soon as we have states whose total electoral college numbers reach 270, then all of the states who signed up agree to actually do this. And right now, I checked, there are 16 states that are signed up. 
and that's 196 electoral votes. So if they can get it to 270, the whole system may change in the future. And you know the problem with these things is that it, it's always going to benefit one party or another whenever the change happens. But over a hundred years, it cuts both ways. Uh, it can benefit, you know, right now, this current system benefits Republicans in Texas. Texas is not 100% Republican. It's probably 55% or 60% Republican. And it's not, it's getting more Democratic. And at some point, Texas will turn completely blue and all 38 electoral college votes under the current system will go to the Democratic candidate. Republicans won't like that much. But if under this new system, if it's proportional, if it's the national vote, then it would be different. Anyway, if you wanna learn more about that and practice your reading of an article, go to the New York Times website. It's an opinion article and it's called the Electoral College Will Destroy America. And it's written by somebody who wrote a book about the Electoral College. Um, you know, well, I, I'm, I'm really thankful. Um, you know, there is one thing that I didn't get every time I read about that. I was just more confused and I just decided not to mention it in the PowerPoint presentation. That was the 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 process of how the parties carry out the caucus and the primaries. Um, do you think that you can help me out with that? Uh, how how is that? Yeah, that's 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 even um, that's more of a mess. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the way this will be very simplified and I'm not an expert, but each party, the two major parties, <clears throat> they want a process that will <clears throat> lead to them selecting their most competitive candidate in the general election. They want to make sure that, that they select the candidate who is most likely to win in the general election against the other party. How do you get to select the candidate that's most competitive? Um, you could have a primary on a single day in all the states at once. And th this decision would, is, is made separately between the two parties. The Republicans can do it one way and the Democrats can do it another way. Um, the way that they have elected to do it is that they have a series of primaries that occur state by state over a period of many months until by the end of the process, every state has had a chance to say who they think their party's nominee should be. And they try to sequence those votes in a way that tests different ways that different parts of the country vote and that in theory allows for uh, a consensus and a majority uh, uh, of their delegates, when they come together in a meeting, which is their party's convention, that they have a majority that have agreed to select a certain candidate. And there may be many candidates. It's not just between two people. There may be 10 or 15. So it's complicated. And um, some states do it differently. Some states do a regular election. Some states do something called a caucus, which you know they bring together people in a room and they talk to each other and then they go into different corners of the room and say who they support. It sounds very, uh, it sounds very democratic. It sounds very um, uh, thoughtful, but it really, in my opinion, is uh, not a good way to do this, particularly because um, a lot of people can't afford the time to go stand around in a space. And, and so you end up having the people who participate in the states that do that are the people who have time. 
And so you get a, you get, you get people who you don't get a good representation of all of the citizens. And so, um, and when it's not coordinated well, you get a mess. And there was a mess this year in the state of Iowa for the Democrats um, when they couldn't count the votes right. And it was, it was just a mess. So the process of, the, of each party nominating their candidate has changed over the history of the United States. Um, and the way it currently happens now is through a series of elections starting in, in you know, the beginning of the election year and ending usually in June um, that then um, results in the candidates getting a certain number of delegates. Those delegates go in a non-COVID year, they go to a physical convention and those delegates vote for their candidate. If, there, if there's no candidate has a, has a um, plurality um, of more than 50%, then they need to start negotiating and try and win over some other people's delegates. Um, but that, that didn't happen. That didn't happen this year. Um, before the election, the, the Democrats had already selected basically between the top two candidates. Um, the second candidate, Bernie Sanders already um, conceded to Joe Biden. Well, <laughs> um, are you there? Okay. Uh, well, uh, Matt, Matthew, um, well, I'm sure that all of the participants, the members that took the time to, to talk here and address you with questions, I, I hope that you hadn't feel overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I think that the idea is that we get more interested in the topic of U.S. elections because everything that happens in that country, um, well, affects the rest of the hemisphere. <laughs> so I'm sure that everybody that is in here um, will agree with me to say that um, we want to know more. We want to be more informed and thanks to you that we are so uh here we're having a comment on char Tar Singh, could you open your microphone address your comment to mr Matthew? yes yes i'm here ah, i was say i was i was right to mr Matthew. thank you for sharing your knowledge i look forward you can participate with us in another opportunity Oh, thank you, Char. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure, and um, thank you for uh, all for asking such great questions and for joining the conversation. And if anybody is, you know, watching this recording later and saying, "What does Matt know about elections?" Um, the answer is, I'm not an expert, um, and uh, I do my best to share my own views and and to try and convey the way things work. Um, if I didn't get it right, I'm happy to be corrected on certain parts of this. Um, and uh, it's a it's a consequential year. It's an important election year, and we're less than 60 days away from the election. And it matters a lot what happens uh, uh, in this election. And um, thank you for your interest. And I also watch you know closely the evolution of the crisis in Venezuela as well. And and, and wish you and the entire country, however it comes, uh, a, a peaceful resolution and uh, in, in a way that can, can bring uh, the Venezuelan economy back and, and can, can help make sure people can meet their basic needs across the country. Um, it's, it's a tough time. <laughs>